and welcome to another Facebook Live here at the Marshalls Museum. Sorry about the weird beginning there. Uh, we've got a couple of other things that are going on right now, and part of that is the computer I was originally starting on was, um, I went out of the room for a second, I come back, and it decides that it wants to restart, and it's going to have a big issue, so I am now running this on my desktop. Uh, I wish I could have just jumped onto that one and just had a good time because I had a whole ton of stuff prepped. I had the second camera prepped up, and so we're going to have to just do this one camera for a change. Uh, we have, as you guys probably figured out last week, we've gotten some new technology uh, between a new webcam here, we've got a lavalier mic, and so all that stuff is set up, ready to go, and it's going to be for some good, uh, some good stuff that was going to get produced. Uh, as you guys saw last week, uh, you see what happens, and then again this week, you see what happens with materials, uh, brand new technology. We come in, we start using it, and so uh, last week I know there were some audio issues that were coming up, and I'm hoping this week's going to be a little bit better, a little bit easier for us. Uh, so if nothing else, we've gotten through the headache that we've gotten through already. Uh, again, if anybody has any questions at any time, please feel free to throw them into the comments and I'll be more than happy to try to answer those as we go through. Uh, this is a, today's particular subject on the Mariolitos and the Cuban uh, refugees who came to America 40 years ago. Uh, it really started to get into the news. It started in April that year for April 1980 for the immigration, but it really started to get into the news for us anyway as marshals uh, starting in May because that was about the time that Special Operations, Special Operations Group was assigned to the Marialitos camp in Florida. And so uh, from there on, uh, we've got some great stuff I want to show to you today. Uh, it's a little bit helter skelter right now because just the nature of how I'm had to rearrange things uh, last minute. But we are going to be able to tell this story. Uh, I see Jarena's popped in. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Jarena used to work here at the Marshalls Museum. Always a great time, great person to see here. We were hoping to be able to do something for the census this week, uh, which I think that might be why Jarena is here. Uh, I know that we are going to especially uh, focus on uh, the uh, we're going to focus on the census in an upcoming episode. I'm um, talking to somebody at the Census Bureau to hopefully get in on that. And um, Juan Torres, uh, he died on Memorial Day. Are you talking about? Um, is that something that just happened recently? Because uh, that we're not familiar with. Um, but uh, I, I, go ahead and uh, message me more uh, on that, and we'll find out what went on with uh, retired U.S. Marshal uh, Torres. Um, I know there's a number of different deputies, uh, court security officers, and other folks uh, recently who've just passed away uh, from different reasons, everything from COVID-19 to uh, uh, cancer as a result of 9-11 to some other things that uh, are going to start becoming more public here in the future, but until Marshal Service makes a determination on some of those, we're not, we don't normally uh, comment on anything like that until Marshal Service comes out and makes their statement. Uh, again, we are not the Marshal Service. We are very much honored to be able to tell their story, but we also respect and appreciate their position as that agency whose story we're trying to tell. And so uh, if there's something, some story that's going on in uh, current news, uh, there was a, for example, a deputy who was shot a couple of weeks ago while a uh, warrant was being executed and over in uh, Mississippi, I believe it was. And uh, we held off on making any statement about that until the marshal service did. Uh, so we try to respect the marshal service uh, position on a lot of these different issues. Uh, if it's somebody who's retired, who passed away, uh, there are uh, there are some different things along those lines. Uh, we tend to go more towards the line of duty, uh, things like that. Uh, some particular individuals who we have 
come across in the store in the course of telling these stories. Uh, we do get a chance to remember them in different ways. Uh, but by all means, I would love to find out more about uh, uh, Tart Marshall Torres. Uh, I, he's not a name I personally know anything about, but there's literally thousands upon thousands of deputies who have served, uh, and tens of thousands of deputies who have served, and uh, many, well over a thousand U.S. Marshals. And so we try to tell the stories that we can. Uh, this is the first we've heard of that individual. Um, but towards the story, uh, a couple things to take care of. If you don't know about it, next Monday, just before I get into the story of the Mariolitos, uh, next Monday at 5 p.m. Central Time on our YouTube station, our YouTube channel, uh, we are going to be having a live stream. Uh, I'm going to actually, let me switch over to, I believe I have the information. There we go. Uh, Dr. Malcolm Glover, he is going to be coming in here to the museum and we're going to be live streaming his presentation as part of our Talks on Tap series. The Talks on Tap series is our lecture series for this spring. Uh, the original plan was March, April, and May. First Mondays we were going to have folks come in and talk about just different aspects of civility in America. And so we had the first one in March and then COVID-19 kicked in. And so the building is still closed here at the Marshalls Museum, but uh, Dr. Glover is gonna be in here next Monday. And as part of that, we are going to have Dr. Glover uh, live stream on our YouTube channel. And so we will have him do that. The following month, we are gonna have the third in our Talks on Tap series uh, that is going to be, uh, he's going to stay where he is back east and talk to us over Zoom, and then we'll live stream that conversation uh, and that lecture from him. Uh, and as the title suggests, Talks on Tap, we were planning to have local microbreweries come in and give samples of their beers, and so everybody can have a nice adult beverage if they so choose and enjoy the lecture. Uh, since that's not going to be able to happen, by all means, please feel free to uh, sit at home crack a cold one or whatever you choose to drink that evening, if you choose to drink that evening, and uh, sit down and feel free to watch uh, Dr. Glover. Uh, we will have questions and answers during that, uh, so we'll be monitoring the comments. So if you have any questions about the presentation or any questions uh, along those lines with his presentation, by all means catch that. Uh, and probably within the next few days, we're going to be throwing our first lecture from this series on our YouTube channel as well. So you'll be able to catch that one and catch up. So uh, with that, um, a little bit of background on the story of the Mariolitos. Uh, this goes all the way back to the late 1970s. Cuba is in a uh, financial situation. Uh, Cuban and American relations start getting better during the time, uh, during, especially during the Carter presidency. It leads up to a point, though, in 79, that there are a number of people wanting to leave Cuba. They start trying to get asylum in different Central American and then, uh, South American countries. And eventually, it finally comes up to a head where America says, that we're going to accept some refugees from Cuba. And so as a result of those refugees coming up from Cuba, uh, this happens very quickly. Over a couple of months in April of 1980, uh, we go from saying, okay, sure, we'll take some refugees. And then Castro decides, all right, we're gonna get rid of more people. And then everybody starts making an agreement that we'll accept, uh, at the time, there, America was just looking at about 10,000, I think it was. Uh, we're looking at accepting uh, possibly 10,000 immigrants. And what ended up happening was the uh, Cubans ended up, Castro said that anybody who can get to the Mariel port in Cuba and have somebody come there and pick them up in a boat, we'll let them go. And so hundreds of boats started to show up from Florida getting down to, uh, down to Cuba. Uh, Cuban fishermen started loading up their boats with people and they started going to Florida and they started getting into Florida as immigrants. About that same time, Cuba also started to get rid of anybody they saw as 
of their political prisoners, anybody who was in opposition to the Castro regime, uh, the people they saw as being uh, culturally or socially subversive, uh, homosexuals, prostitutes, uh, anybody who was just anti-Castro, anybody who was not seen as being 100% Cuban, they were allowed to get rid of them. And then they also got rid of some of the worst of their criminals out of their prisons and sent them on their way to Florida. By the time that that summer was done in September, uh, about 125,000 Cubans had immigrated to the United States. During that, uh, many of them were regular people, uh, but a very small number, by the time everything was finally tallied up, uh, only about 2%, 2 percent, two and a half percent were seen as being enough of a criminal element that they did not uh, fit as refugees and they were sent back to Cuba. Uh, as part of all of this, when the uh, refugees first showed up in Florida, they went to, they were put together in like the Miami Orange Bowl and some other places around the area and they, it was realized that a larger area needed to be put together to help process all of these new immigrants. And so they were moved over to Eglin Air Force Base uh, where Camp Liberty or Camp Libertad what Campo Libertad was started up. And uh, Campo Libertad saw the vast majority of these refugees. And as they were processed, many of them ended up staying in the Florida area because of the uh, large Cuban population there. But those who were not able to be uh, repatriated into, well, set up in the Florida area were eventually split off into one of three different uh, camps across the country. Uh, you had um, just so I don't forget, obviously the easy one that I always remember here was uh, Camp Chaffee here in uh, the Fort Smith area, but they also went to uh, Fort McCoy in Wisconsin, uh, Fort Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania, and also there was a camp set up in Puerto Rico, uh, Camp Santiago. And at first, at the camp in Miami, most of the guards were uh, Air Force and uh, military police type things. And they didn't deal well with uh, working with these the large group of refugees. And since this was much more of a federal issue and given the nature of what was going on, the uh, Marshal Service ended up getting involved and they assigned a special operations group to go and take care of the situation in Florida. Keep in mind the special operations group in the Marshal Service is a very highly trained organization uh, usually uh, there'll be a few people from each district who end up getting qualified, go to a special school for the special operations group. Uh, even today, uh, it's, it's really, honestly, some of the best people within the Marshall Service. They end up uh, taking a lot of people who are uh, prior military service. Uh, they take a lot of people who are prior law enforcement. And they are involved in many of the higher uh, importance missions that the Marshal Service takes on. Uh, they were involved in uh, the Siege of Wounded Knee. They were involved in uh, other instances where uh, large riots were to take place. Uh, there were at places that uh, any time that there, there was seen to be something in the way of a possibility of a mass demonstration or violence, uh, very high uh, importance uh, court cases, they would be there as well. And so the special operations group showed up, which apparently started a little bit of a panic among the Cubans because the jumpsuits, and you'll see some pictures of that here in a bit, the jumpsuit suits that were worn by the special operations group were very reminiscent of the same outfits that Cuba's security police wore. And so the Cubans at first thought that they were Cuban security police come to get them, take them back. But they very quickly got uh, got over that and they understood what was going on and the marshals ended up becoming uh, very tightly uh, wound into the uh, very tightly knit into that community of that base and that camp uh, so what I want to show you now are some of the things that we have uh, some of these uh, some of the people who have been involved in the marshal service for many years might know the name Mike Hammer uh, Mike Hammer was that's not the uh, this is, uh, his nickname is Mike, Francis Hammer. Uh, he was assigned down there. Uh, and he arrived in July that year. 
and was one of the last deputies to be uh, take uh, to leave the base in September. Uh, the camp opened up in on May 3rd, 1980, and one of the things that was produced during the time that they were there was the Camp Libertad Periodico, and that is a uh, little newspaper that was produced every almost every day at uh, Eglin Air Force Base. And so each issue would have uh, news that was going on. And I'm gonna, as I've said before, with a lot of the paper materials, I like to not wear gloves, uh, simply because with the paper documents, uh, the gloves can catch on uh, loose tears and things like that, cause more damage. Uh, they had information in Spanish and English about uh, different events that were going on. They would have different things about education. They would talk about the church services. Had a lot of English language instruction. And then, especially for the first few, uh, every so often they would have the numbers for the resettlements from Camp Liberty. And they would talk about when and how many had gone to different places. So here, by July 11th, of 115,000 people had been moved from the uh, from Camp Liberty to other camps, and as they went through some of the stuff that would happen, uh, there would be uh, sporting events there. They had baseball and softball leagues, and so here you have the camp softball tournament, and you'll see right down here, right there is U.S. Marshals versus the Interpreters. And so you've got a lot of the different things that, are, that were happening. Uh, you also have in a lot of the issues different uh, puzzle or just like, like this is again more English language training. Uh, little bits and notes like if you throw trash on the ground someone has to pick it up for you. Things just about how to be essentially being a good person there. And then there's a lot of stuff about living in America. And so this one here talks about driving regulations. There are other ones that talk about just general news. There are things that talk about uh, just anything in the way of life. Uh, here's a crossword puzzle that's based solely on numbers. And so, I mean, a lot of these, uh, you end up with letters from people to, uh, from people who have left the camp to people who are in the camp now. Uh, one of them here is talking about the American school system. So much like what had already gone on with the uh, people who had left Vietnam to come to America uh, after the Vietnam War, you have a lot of people who are being trained essentially what it is to be an American. And uh, you have people who are trying to learn about it. Uh, other things that would show up in the uh, in the Camp Libertad uh, periodico were uh, weather reports of what was coming up for the weather. There would be information about have you applied for this type of citizenship. If you've not done this, this these steps, then you need to make sure that you do them. Uh, there are there's information about. Um, Again, what movies are coming up? Uh, they have the professional baseball leagues, and they're reporting the sports scores. They have uh, different puzzles. They have comics, cartoons that would show up uh, every so often. Uh, but then you would also just so they would know what's going on in camp and uh, different bits of news that are related to them. Here is a map of the United States that shows location of Fort Chaffee. You've got uh, Fort McCoy in Wisconsin, Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. And here you're in uh, Key West, Florida. There's Miami and there's Camp Libertad. And so uh, there were a lot of things like this that would help people understand uh, what parts of the country were like. And even to the point that knowing some people were going to places like uh, Fort Smith and going to Camp Chaffee, they included information about those parts of the country. So this is all about uh, the state of Arkansas in English and in Spanish, and it talks about the state and the history and just some of the stuff uh, about 
what the state's like. And there on the map, it shows where Fort Chaffee and Fort Smith is. It shows uh, Little Rock. It shows Hot Springs National Park. And so it was preparing all of these people to be Americans. And so that's some really neat, I mean, a lot of the people who wonder what's in a museum collection, this is some of the stuff that really excites me, are the uh, documents, the uh, materials like this that help us to understand uh, what it is that we are dealing with. And let me, I'm going to see if I can open up in another screen. I should have available to me here. So I was planning on having a second camera showing you some of the hard copy uh, photographs and now I have to go through and you know, it might be a, I remember where these files are because this was such a hurry switching from that computer to this computer today and let's see I have a number of photographs of the uh, Marshall's operations at Camp Luritad Let's see here. And you know what? I think I'm going to have to uh, I'm going to have to share some of those. I think afterwards, simply because otherwise I'm going to be sitting here going through file after file, trying to nail down exactly where they are, unless I come across them in a real quick. Oh, and these are I found copies of them, but they are bad scans. Um, if you can hold on just one second, I will be right back with some photographs and I'll hold them up here for you so you can get my And there we are. So, let's see. We have there's a photograph Deputy U.S. Marshals from Special Operations Group at Camp Libertad. Shot of them standing in formation. And I'm assuming, because it was my camera who sent this to us, that since this is the one shot I have of a uh, close up of somebody, I'm guessing that that is Deputy Hammer. We've got uh, one of those jumpsuits floating around here in the collection among other and I've got hard copies of these um, this is Gary Alderman a deputy giving a karate demonstration of some sort I'm not sure which martial art it is that he's doing This is a deputy named Sid Johnson, and by a Deputy Hammer's accounts, uh, the Cubans there loved him. So there's, we've got a whole, there's Sid again, breaking, the, breaking some uh, bricks, so. And it looks like uh, by the back of his vest, it looks like he's uh, there. He's doing Taekwondo. So I will uh, try and get some more of those available online so uh, folks can see some of those. Because I know what you're really here for is to see the stuff. Everybody always wants to see the physical stuff, not the photographs and the documents. Um, so with that, one of the things we have is related to the... Uh, Related to the time that they were here in Fort Chaffee, uh, 
it was really kind of a strange thing in Fort Chaffee, partially because there were some, uh, there were a lot of riots here in Fort Chaffee, so the special operations group was very definitely assigned here. Uh, there were a lot of people who, they just had to get through some legal hoops to be able to become citizens. Uh, one of the things that they got involved in was against federal court action. This is a um, pass for uh, James Spears. Uh, Jeff Spears is actually one of the founding board members for the Marshalls Museum here in town. He's a Fort Smith uh, kid. Uh, he uh, ended up as a uh, judge here in town and has uh, been here for many years. And he's one of the people who's been able to uh, help us be what we are here. Uh, but uh, he donated that to us. That was his ID badge for Camp Chaffee at that time because he was working as a public defender as part of that system. Um, one of the things that we have that I, it was, I was just boggled when it showed up, this is on loan to us from the Marshal Service. This chain and the padlock that is here may not seem like much, but if, uh, this is the key for this is the key for that chain and the padlock. This is the chain that was on the gate at Camp Libertad, or one of the gates at Camp Libertad. So uh, they were able to Marshal Service was able to get this. Uh, apparently, uh, Deputy Hammer tried to get the American flag before he left, but uh, the Air Force would not let him have it. Uh, let's see, what else did I bring over here? I also have, uh, I mentioned that there were riots, and there were lots of things that happened. I have a small collection of some different uh, weapons that were picked up at different points, uh, some different firearm magazines uh, from different types of firearms, uh, some different things that were used as improvised clubs and tools and things like that. But two of the most impressive things in the collection are these right here. These are, this is a machete made by hand. You can see, uh, I don't know if the, yeah, the camera will show it pretty well. You can see the grinder marks and from the tooling. And then on the back end, they just used electrical tape, not electrical, but uh, cloth and what looks like athletic tape. And so this was confiscated from one of the uh, Cubans during uh, the riots whether that was in uh, Florida or in uh, Fort Smith. And then here is another one that was made. And I'm guessing that this was an M for Marielito. But these are both, I mean, I have to be careful with these because they, may, they look awful and they are awful, but they are a lot sharper than you would imagine that they are. And they are very definitely amongst a small group of things that we have here in the collection that I am very, very careful around because I really don't like to get cut. And stuff like this is stuff that would end up uh, causing some serious damage. But um, let me uh, let me see. I th oh, I've got two more pieces, and they're right here. I think I've shown these before. Um, these are all these are both pieces that were manufactured at Fort Chaffee by Cubans. Uh, this is a little umbrella, a little decorative piece. That's telephone wire. Like if you take uh, the telephone wire that comes out of the wall, if you take that and like for anybody who still has a telephone that plugs into the wall, uh, if you take that wire and you strip it apart into its constituent pieces, uh, there will be four or more wires inside. Uh, that the wire that you see going into the wall or the wire that runs from the wall to the phone. And so what they did is he took, somebody took a uh, piece of metal and took the metal all around and he just used, doing different weaving techniques made this umbrella, which is very, very nice little piece. Uh, another thing that we have here in the collection that is also another art piece uh, was this vase. And these are both dated uh, by their tags, made by a refugee at Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, the other one in 1980, this one in 1981. This says, Cuban Refugee 81 Alberto. So if you know a Cuban refugee who was at Fort Chaffee in 1981, his name was Alberto. If he was in the Padre, 
I would love to meet him and know more about this piece and uh, how it ended up getting made. Uh, there's always wonderful stories behind a lot of these pieces, and there's always a wonderful way to talk about the history of the Marshall Service and the impact that they've had on American history and on other people. Um, and with that, that's most of my show and tell for today. Again, I apologize for the technical issues that we had earlier. Uh, we definitely want to make sure that uh, we get um, a lot more out and that we're able to talk to people about uh, the stories that we have here. If you know more about this, if you were a deputy or knew somebody who was a deputy who was at Camp Liberdad or, or at uh, Fort, uh, Camp Chappie or Indian Town Gap or McCoy up in Wisconsin uh, or even out in Puerto Rico, I would love to hear their stories. We, uh, it, it's a great time to be able to get those stories and gather up the tales of these individuals so we can learn more about what happened and uh, just more about our people, more about the marshals, more about the folks who interface with the marshals coming in to become new Americans from Cuba. Uh, or even like earlier than that from Vietnam. So we are really uh, excited to keep continue to tell these stories, and these are part of the stories that we tell when the museum is going to be opening up in the future. Uh, again, I uh, if there are no questions, I very definitely again want to stress uh, Monday night, that is 5 p.m. Uh, Central Time, uh, we are going to be having the uh, we're going to be having a presentation, uh, and again, please, do, if you live in Fort Smith, please do not show up at the museum. We are going to be having this uh, broadcast live on our YouTube channel, and if Casey could throw the uh, link up for this, uh, that would be great. Um, and then uh, I, my comments weren't scrolling. I saw Bob Ernst had commented that Juan Torres was a Purple Heart recipient from Korea in the Vietnam War, and he recently passed away. Uh, so we'll very definitely want to try and find out more about him. Uh, with, the, uh, with the presentation on Monday, though, uh, don't come to the museum. You won't be able to get in, but very definitely go online. Uh, we will be streaming it on our YouTube channel. And like it says, talks on tap, by all means, uh, feel free to uh, have an adult beverage if you so choose. Otherwise, uh, we are more than happy to uh, continue to help people learn more about the Marshall Service. Over the next few weeks, I am planning on having uh, at least one interview with a, if not two different interviews, with people at other museums who have materials on the Marshall Service. Uh, one in Wyoming, one in uh, another location here in town. Uh, we are also looking at doing a. Uh, we're also looking at doing an interview. Uh, I'm trying to get hold of a particular person at the uh, Census Bureau because the marshals for the first hundred years of the census, we were the marshal service uh, was behind performing the census. Uh, before the Census Bureau really kind of became a thing. And so uh, I very definitely want to uh, get a chance to talk to that person and get her take on that part of the history, especially from their side of the fence. Uh, if you have not filled out your census forms, please do so. Uh, please find, uh, if you know people who, excuse me, if you know people who have received the census and haven't filled it out and haven't done the census, uh, by all means, make sure that those folks see it, get it, and fill it and send it in because the census very much helps your community. It helps funding go to your state, your county, your city. It helps funding go to your local organizations. It helps funding come in that otherwise would go someplace else. And I mean, because really when it comes down to it, uh, everybody who's counted in your area on the census, uh, the number for Fort Smith, I know, uh, I think, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, I want to say it goes to something like uh, $10,000 a person. And uh, knowing that the marshals were involved in this way back when, uh, the marshals aren't involved in it as much, well, they aren't involved in it really anymore. But the, uh, with that history of the census, though, and I know that it helps organizations like ours, it helps organizations across the country who are able to take part in 
in and help teach people about history. So uh, by all means, uh, and we'll be uh, trying to let people know a little bit more ahead of time what the presentations are that we're going to be doing. Uh, beyond that, very definitely, uh, as uh, somebody who's trying to help tell the story of the Marshalls uh, and knowing some of the things that have been going on behind the scenes over the last few months, uh, please, by all means, uh, try and be safe. Try and, again, maintain your social distancing. Try and uh, make sure that you and yours are staying healthy. And think about those folks who, like the court security officers, deputies, and others, who every day have to put their lives on the line in order to help perform the mission of safeguarding our courts, of transporting prisoners, of uh, just doing the job they always have to do, but they now have an additional specter that they have to watch out for. Because I know that uh, there are uh, very definitely some people uh, who we may have to uh, add to the wall at some point. Uh, just as a result of their being exposed to coronavirus. And so, uh, by all means, please stay safe. Uh, and again, if there is some subject, some topic that you want the museum to talk to, uh, if you want uh, something here at the Marshalls Museum that you would like me to talk about uh, on one of the Facebook Lives, uh, let me know. I am more than happy to uh, come in and uh, we can figure out what subject it is, and if it's not something that we can talk about, we'll find the right person to talk about that. Uh, but as we go forward, again, this is, uh, I think this is about the 10th or 12th one of these that we've done. Uh, so uh, if nothing else, one of the things that coronavirus has done is it's led us to be able to have this chance to have a conversation with our, our public. Uh, so if you have any questions, by all means, contact us through the Facebook page. Uh, you can throw them up at any time. Uh, those questions will always come back to the right person here at the museum, and we'll be able to uh, answer what we can when we can. Uh, if there's nothing else anybody has today, uh, by all means, have a great week. Have a great weekend. Hope to see you Monday night uh, or Monday evening or afternoon, depending on where you live, uh, at our uh, on our YouTube channel for our YouTube Live that we're going to be doing with Dr. Malcolm Glover. Uh, that would be a great lecture. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff that, his, we've been throwing a lot more stuff on our YouTube channel. Uh, Leslie Higgins, our director of education, has been doing a lot of great uh, material uh, for kind of, and now that the school year is kind of ending for a lot of places. Uh, she's been doing a lot of uh, museum at home stuff, uh, different books on uh, everything from citizenship to the Constitution. Uh, we've been doing a Life in the Box series where you can, uh, see little facts about somebody and try to figure out who it is before she does the big reveal at the end of the video. And uh, not only that, we've got tons of oral histories from Marshalls from the past, and we're going to be continuing to add those uh, to our channel as we continue into the future. So uh, if anybody has a question, by all means, contact us through the Facebook page or our webpage, uh, and just uh, let us know what you're thinking. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you all have a great day. And that, uh, and again, as I said, I hope that everybody is able to stay safe and uh, be well. Thanks a lot.